first, we'll start with you talk about your first term, uh, some accomplishments that you, uh, you feel like you uh, are proud of and achieved. Yeah, uh, I'm State Representative Aaron Zwiener. I uh, represent House District 45, Hayes and Blanco Counties. Just finished, well, I'm in the middle of my first term, but this last spring had my uh, first legislative session. Uh, and I'm really proud of some of the work we did. Uh, my office was able to pass two bills that are now law. Uh, one of those will allow the city of Buda to invest in aquifer storage and recovery, which will help them save more surface water in times of excess and store that in underground cave structures um, in the aquifer and then use that in times of drought. And it should, we hope, reduce reliance um, on Edwards aquifer water in times when that aquifer is stressed. So important work for uh, water conservation, which is a critical issue in all of Central Texas, uh, but particularly in my district. We also passed a piece of legislation uh, to allow small cities in Hayes and Blanco counties to use um, hotel and occupancy tax revenue to promote dark skies, specifically to actually change out lighting infrastructure um, to better protect the night sky. And I'm really proud of that because it's something that several of my communities are proud of. Uh, we have two of the three certified dark sky communities uh, in Texas, our in-house District 45. That's Wimberley and Dripping Springs. And then the city of Blanco is also in the process of applying for the same designation. And the city of Buda has been pursuing more dark sky protections as well. It's a source of tourism for the area. Folks travel out to the hill country to enjoy astronomical events like meteor showers. Uh, and it's something that really impacts the local character. Uh, I also led the fight um, against the Kinder Morgan uh, Permian Highway Pipeline uh, that's bisecting my district, going through the cities of Blanco and Kyle and very near Wimberley and Wood Creek. Uh, it's going to be a 42-inch natural gas pipeline, uh, and it'll be the first large oil and gas transmission pipeline to come through the hill country since the 1950s. Um, Many folks, uh, including myself, are concerned that it's not an appropriate route, that it poses some threats to the aquifer, to some of the unique ecological concerns in the hill country, um, and also that it's going to dramatically impact the economic development of some of our rapidly growing communities like the city of Kyle. Uh, so I, um, as a freshman member of the minority party, was able to get four hearings on bills related to pipelines, and those ranged from legislation to better protect landowners from companies not doing their side of the agreement, uh, legislation to provide more uh, resources for emergency preparedness, uh, and legislation to make sure the local elected officials are tied into the planning process for those pipelines. Um, I think we started really critical conversations, and next session I'm really hoping we can move those forward and make some changes. Um, in particular, I think it's wrong that there is no public routing process for these large pipelines. The route is decided in a corporate boardroom and folks on the ground do not have any elected official they can call to impact that final route. And that's wrong. If a company is going to have the power of eminent domain, uh, they also need to have the same oversight and transparency that the government has when they exercise that power. Uh, Lastly, uh, I'll mention that I, I learned the rules. So the, uh, the legislature is a very technical beast and we have a process for how we go through bills. And if something breaks those rules, that can be a way, even if you don't have the votes, to stop a bad piece of legislation. Um, I learned the rules and I called a successful point of order on a bill that would have taken away uh, water quality protections in much of central Texas. Uh, the bill specifically would have removed those water quality protections in the ETJ of cities. And that's a big deal because most of the growth we are experiencing in Hayes County right now isn't in city limits. It's in ETJs or it's an unincorporated county. I wanted to make sure my community still had that tool and I was able to stop that bill in its tracks using the rules of the house. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Especially. I guess the thing I feel like I'm required to say in every one of these is uh, I also was really proud to be mentioned in Texas Monthly's wrap up uh, of the best and worst of the legislative session. And they actually described me as the most savvy of the freshman legislators uh, and a potential future leader of the House Democrats. So I'm, I'm happy that my work has been noticed and I, I hope I can continue to do it. 
And so those were great accomplishments. How about disappointments? Uh, would we be talking about some of the same things if you didn't, didn't <laughs> quite get that? Yeah, um, you know, I a big disappointment to me was related to the pipeline issue. There was a, a bill for eminent domain reform that would have given landowners some more tools. It would have balanced the scale so that they had uh, more say during the process. And the bill would have done three things. It would have required a landowner meeting. Uh, it would have set some minimum easement terms. Uh, and it would have created penalties for uh, low ball offers being used to strong arm landowners. Uh, that bill, there's a lot of work done on it. Um, I was a co a, an early co-author of the bill, uh, working with Representative Dwayne Burns on it. It passed through the Senate, a watered down version passed through the House, but we as the House actually did this unusual motion, a motion to instruct, where we asked the conference committee on the bill to please return to the Senate version of the language. And that motion passed. Uh, but unfortunately, there was one member who was in a strategic position that was able to interrupt that bill and it didn't pass. And that means that as this pipeline comes across my district, my landowners are still operating um, at a disadvantage and that's not fair. Uh, so that was a big disappointment for me and I really hope that's something we can bring back next session and get over the finish line. Um, another big disappointment for me is Medicaid expansion. Uh, we did have a vote on it on the House floor this time, which is unusual, but um, it's, it's so critical. Texas has the highest uninsured rate in the nation. And even folks who have insurance are seeing their insurance coverage get worse and worse, whether they're buying through the marketplace or have employer provided. It has just gotten harder and harder. Uh, if we expanded Medicaid in the state of Texas, we'd cover another one and a half million people. We'd bring another $6 billion of money back into Texas every year. And that money is our federal tax dollars that we aren't getting to use because legislators in Texas dug their heels in the ground and refused to act. Um, I really wish we'd gotten more momentum on that uh, and been able to move it forward because it would make such a difference in the lives of Texas. If we up the number of folks who have insurance, that means that everyone's costs go down. Because right now, those of us with insurance or those of us who are able to pay out of pocket, we're not only paying for our medical care, we're also paying for the medical care of everyone who walks into a provider and never pays their bill. So we're still paying for it, we're just paying for it very inefficiently, and it's working Texans that are feeling it the hardest. On that point, on Texas being stubborn and refusing <laughs> the Medicaid money, um, do you see any hope that they will, you know, uh, not give in, but at least be willing to talk about some compromise there? That the Republicans will? You know, I, I absolutely think there's hope uh, that we will see some bipartisan effort to expand Medicaid. There already has been some bipartisan effort to find ways to bring some of those dollars down, uh, particularly for our rural hospitals, uh, because not expanding Medicaid has disproportionately impacted them. And we've seen rural hospitals closing their doors, um, which concerns me, you know, especially since I do represent a rural county that has seen their providers get further and further away from them. I, I do think there's hope, um, but I do think the, the balance of power in the body has to change a little bit first. Um, you know, I, I come from a moderate Republican family. Uh, they're still a little bit confused that they have a progressive Democratic daughter. Uh, <laughs> and and my, my parents don't like what they see in the leadership in Texas right now. And we talk about it, and I explain this is what happens when one party gets control for a sustained period of time. When election season comes, they only look over the right shoulder. They don't look over the left. And so everybody moves further and further to the right. Um, one party control favors a primary system choosing more and more extreme individuals. And we've got to break that pattern in Texas. And I think the way we do is make general elections competitive again. Talk a little bit about one of the biggest things on your platform, which is to improve uh, voter registration. Uh, efforts along those lines. What do you, what do you plan to do there? Yeah, um, I think folks being engaged in the democratic process is really critical and is one of the reasons that I ran for office is because I believe in representative democracy. And representative democracy includes voting, but it also includes reaching out to your representatives, asking them for help, holding them accountable if they don't tell you the truth or are working against your in interests. It, democracy is a verb. We have to participate in it. Um, and I grew up here in Central Texas, and by the time I turned 18, I knew deep down, gut level, my vote didn't count. That Texas was too big, no one would ever care what my vote said, it would never make a difference. Um, 
I got a little bit lucky in how I got broken out of that, which is that I moved to Montana, which is a very small state. <laughs> um, and one of the first elections I voted in was a very close Senate race that was decided by a couple thousand votes. And so I looked up and I'm like, I can knock on a couple thousand doors. I could have made the difference in this race. And it, and it drove it home. Um, and so I think we have to keep sharing that message with folks in Texas who haven't been engaged. Um, a big part of my work is registering voters. I registered five this week, actually, on Tuesday night. Um, three of them first-time voters, one of whom was in her 60s um, and had never registered or voted. And I think what's critical is both to make sure that being able to vote is accessible. We have made it really hard just to even register. We still use a paper voter registration system, which costs us a lot of money, costs um, our county election offices a lot of staff time in processing all of those when most other states have moved over to an online voter registration system. And those are easy, they're secure, uh, they actually get better information because you don't have challenges with reading handwriting, and they mean that folks can easily show up and participate in the process. That's what we want. And I think if folks are afraid of more, pe more people voting, uh, they should get in a different business because <laughs> that's what this is about. Um, so online voter registration, I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, I think that's an important first step, and then we can talk about things like same-day voter registration or moving towards some type of automatic system that we've seen other states pursue. Uh, I also think Texas should explore doing what several other states have and allowing anyone to vote by mail. Um, I did grad school in Arizona, and I voted there, and I vote, we voted by mail. Or anyone could. You could vote at the polling place, or you could vote by mail. And I've never been a more informed voter than when I could take my time and research each race on the ballot. Um, Another key component is making sure that if folks show up to vote, they're not turned away because they don't have the right type of ID um, or have showed up uh, in an awkward location. You know, that's why same-day registration can make that difference if someone's moved and hasn't updated their registration. Uh, and removing or relaxing our voter ID laws could make sure that more folks are able to participate in the process. You were ranked one of the... Uh, most liberal members in the House, but there are conservative voters in your district, of course. How do you uh, approach them and, and tell them that you represent their interests too? Yeah, so my voting record, honestly, reflects me voting with my district. A lot of those bills that are rated on that partisan scale are environmental votes. And I have to say folks in my district, regardless of whether they're blue or red, they're green. I'm a lifelong conservationist. One of my first jobs was knocking on doors for Texas Campaign for the Environment. I then went and got a degree in natural resource conservation from the University of Montana and worked for conservation organizations like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, and some other smaller nonprofits protecting natural spaces. And uh, a good chunk of my job was sitting down with loggers and environmentalists and getting them on the same page and getting them to come together and move forward with a project. And you know, what I realized doing that work is that the value those folks shared was that they loved the land. And that's true of my district too. Folks move to Hayes or Blanco counties because they love the place. And that's reflected regardless of where they are on national hot button issues. So I consistently voted to protect our air, protect our water, protect our open space. Without any more candidates here, we're breezing through this. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have anything? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the political leadership in the state, and obviously we're going to see some kind of change in the House chamber in terms of leadership next session. I wonder what you're looking for in a speaker. Maybe you could talk about what role Democrats could play, depending on you know how some of these elections play out. And if it ends up being Republican in the speaker's chair again, what, we, what kind of speaker are you looking for there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we're going to have a speaker's race either way uh, because our current speaker is not running for re-election. I, uh, as a Democrat, remain ever hopeful that we will be choosing a Democratic speaker. And in that case, uh, what I'll be looking for is somebody who can really hold the entire Democratic caucus together. Uh, we are a coalition party. We are diverse. Not all of us are the same. Um, and so we need someone that has trust across the breadth of our membership and the ability to organize us. Um, I think the second thing that's really critical to me, particularly for a Democratic speaker, is um, the ability to both hold their ground uh, with other state leaders, such as our governor and our lieutenant governor, but also the ability to work with and negotiate them. 
I do not want us to have a session where the Senate passes bills and the House passes bills and never the two shall meet. <laughs> um, there is bipartisan work to be done, um, despite some of the really unfortunate uh, race to the edges we've seen. Um, and to me, a leader that can help us thread that needle. So to both stand firm and advance our own values, but also where their space move forward is critical. Um, if Republicans have leadership, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. Um, I'm hopeful that we will have someone uh, that will continue to honor the tradition of our other recent speakers, including Speaker Bonin and Speaker Strauss before him, of having bipartisan leadership of the various committees. Um, and I'm hopeful that we have someone um, who will temper their party's worst impulses. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm a founding member of the House LGBTQ caucus. We did have an anti-LGBTQ bill pass the legislature this session. Um, it was the least bad of the bills we thought might have passed. And I remain hopeful that it could be the last time that that body feels the need to send that kind of signal. So my read is that my, my read right now is under Republican leadership. There's a lot of bills that are done to signal to the far right. And I would hope that we have we get a Republican leader who sees that Texas is asking for us to move on from that. There's been a lot of talk in the interim about uh, gun safety and school mm -hmm. safety and things like that. I wonder if you could speak to kind of what you're hearing in terms of what might realistically happen on that front next session, because it seems like there's a willingness on both sides to do something, but what? Yeah, no, I, I think you're correct. This is the first time I've seen the possibility of movement on gun safety legislation. Uh, when I came into the House, I mean, nothing, very few things even got a hearing, much less move forward. The only thing that actually went into law on the side of gun safety um, was work that Donna Howard got into the budget uh, for a million dollars for a safe storage uh, public information campaign. That was the only thing that made it into law. Um, one other bill related to guns being on tarmacs passed the legislature, both the Senate and the House, but was vetoed by the governor. Um, I am seeing a crack. I'm seeing a real crack in the conversations, and that makes me really hopeful. Um, and I'll be clear, that that's a big issue in my district. I mean, we have a neighborhood where um, a man walks down the street carrying a semi-automatic rifle regularly, and folks call the police department every day, and they tell them, we can't do anything about it. If he wants to walk down this street with children playing, he gets to do that. Um, so I think we need to address some of these questions in this cultural corner we've gotten ourselves into. And where I see conversations happening um, are around closing uh, the background check loopholes, which I think is really critical. I think it's certain that we're going to close some technical loopholes, um, like around the issues Representative Gina Inahosa has brought up of intrastate um, warrants not showing up in the background check system. I mean, I think we're definitely going to do some technical work like that. The question to me is whether or not we get the momentum to actually close the private sale loophole and make sure that everyone who purchases a gun, even if it's at, even if it's at a gun show um, or from someone off Craigslist, has to go through the same background check process. Um, and to me, that really depends on momentum and what happens in these elections. Um, the other area where I'm hearing some conversation that's relevant to the issue I brought up in Kyle is um, we're having some conversation about requiring permits for the open carry of long guns. And, you know, I, I work for Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, which is a conservation organization founded by hunters. I think anything we design really has to not catch hunters. Um, but there's a big difference between carrying um, a single shot <laughs> rifle over your shoulder and a semi-automatic rifle with a 60 clip magazine. Those are very, very different things. Um, and I think our laws need to reflect that. So instead of classifying guns by handgun or long gun, I think we need to look at the action mechanisms um, and require folks who wanna carry these in public to have some type of permit, which the main impetus for, or the main benefit of, is it gives law enforcement basis to kind of stop and ask questions and make sure everything's okay. Right now, anytime a law enforcement officer stops someone open carrying a long gun in a public space, they're at risk of that person claiming they're being discriminated against and pursuing civil action against the law enforcement officer. And I don't think that's the, that's not the Texas I wanna live in. I want our law enforcement officers to be able to be vigilant and investigate suspicious situations.
sorry I came in late, and if you already answered something like this, then just tell me to watch the tape. Um, so after one term in the ledge, which I'm sure was a eye-opening experience, um, like what, have, what, what do you think you learned and what will make you more effective um, the next term? One of the most surprising things I learned, um, and I say surprising because it, it goes in the face of so much stereotype about politics, um, was how much emphasis there is on honesty and keeping your word and seeing what happens to folks who, who break that bond and give inaccurate information to their colleagues or, or change their path without giving an answer why. Um, and that was really heartening for me to realize. You know, there is, there is a bond of that. Um, so you're talking about like if somebody makes a representation about what their bill will do or... Yeah, if, if, you, if I go to you and I say my bill does X and it actually does Y and that comes back and hurts that legislator, they're never going to trust me again. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised to learn that. Um, in terms of like things I learned to do better, I, it's less a do better and it's more a deepening in terms of building those relationships with folks um, regardless of whether or not we're natural allies. I'm, I'm excited to have those deeper relationships established with more senior members. I'm excited to go back and not be in the deep end of you have 149 people to get to know whose votes you need tomorrow. Um, instead, those relationships are established. Um, folks already trust me. They know I will tell them you know, the good side and the bad side of what I'm working on and will reflect how it impacts their district if it does. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be starting from that framework instead of starting from day one with no reputation, no trust. Um, and I think that will make a big difference. Uh, the other piece is just learning the process. Everyone talks about legislation in terms of how do you pass a bill. Uh, in the process, it's really more about how do you stop a bill from dying? There are a million little nooks and corners and crannies of the legislature where a bill can go and die. And you have to go make sure your bill isn't slipping into it um, along the way. And there are folks who will kind of silently push your bill there. And maybe you don't notice because you're a freshman. Um, as a sophomore legislator, I will notice <laughs> and be able to get my bill out of that corner more quickly. Uh, on the relationships, was there any like surprising one, especially across the aisle, that uh, relationship you were able to build, that you and Roscoe, Roscoe Kane getting together for something? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I actually, I mean, I know that's a joke, but I, I actually get along pretty well with Briscoe Kane and Jonathan Briscoe, Stickland. Yeah, sorry, yes. We agree on almost nothing, Briscoe. and we've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe plenty of times, but actually Briscoe and I went, went back and forth about the rules, and he's one of the people that helped me learn the rules. Um, so, I mean, it is interesting, because when you're in that body, it's more important that you're one of the 150 than any particular label. Uh, but honestly, the relationship I've really valued... Um, among the most is um, I've built a really good relationship with Representative Terry Wilson from Marble Falls. Um, we both have a similar issue in our district related to rock quarries and concrete batch plants. Um, and Rep Wilson, I'm sure, I don't know precisely, but he's one of the most conservative legislators. I'm one of the most liberal legislators. Uh, we see pretty eye to eye on this issue. And sometimes we have different tactics for approaching it, but he and I really worked um, hand in hand during session to try and get that issue on the radar. And I'm really happy to see that our work has culminated in uh, the speaker naming an interim special committee on aggregates to look at these issues with quarries um, and concrete batch plants. And Representative Wilson is the chair. I'm very honored to be a member of that committee. Um, and I'm confident we'll do good work going forward. Do you see anything specifically that could come out of that committee regarding the quarries and yeah, there's, there's several ideas we're looking at regarding quarries. Um, the, the sort of macro issue I'm really concerned about is where are these going and are they appropriate locations? Um, as I mentioned, most of the growth in my district is happening outside city limit signs. The only group in Texas that can actually say, no, you can't stick a quarry there is a city within their city limits. Um, so we've had issues with these facilities popping up in locations that are just inappropriate. Uh, there's one in my district that's actually in Austin's ETJ. It's not a quarry, it's a um, bulk materials handling facility, but it bought 10 acres of land in a sort of semi-rural residential area. Um, it enters the rural road on a blind curve, so it's a major issue with transportation. It's a very narrow road. The road's rated to 18,000 pounds. Uh, they are driving 60,000 pound trucks down it, tearing up the road very quickly. Um, the road 
or the, the driveway for the facility goes within 50 yards of a private home. Um, and the trucks are so heavy that they shake her home. Uh, and on top of that, because of the business model of these facilities of wanting to deliver material uh, to building sites first thing in the morning, they start operating at 4.30 in the morning. And it's just dramatically impacted the quality of life of the neighbors. And so that intersection of nuisance issues, transportation issues, um, I'm, and just general quality of life issues, I'm really concerned about and we need there to be another way to evaluate that location. I'm in conversations about giving some counties that authority to do some siting related to aggregates. Um, we're also having conversations about having you know, stricter parameters for TCEQ, uh, permitting facilities like requiring a larger distance from private homes um, and being clearer on where the boundary is because oftentimes TCEQ will do the setback based on the location of, of the piles or um, of the rock crusher, not of the property boundary. And those nuisance issues, again, in this case, are related to where the road is located. Um, so there's a lot of issues we're looking at. Um, I know Representative Wilson is looking very closely at issues related to decommissioning quarries and making sure there are minimum standards. Um, that's really important because we've had incidences of quarries being closed and just leaving a gaping hole in the ground. In fact, there's a retired one in my district um, that Austin Water owns now, where they bored into the top of the aquifer and there's now a permanent lake um, outside of Buda. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of concerns. Um, and, it, and the other big issue is just looking at the air quality permitting and making sure the modeling really lines up with the impacts on the community and the ground. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether or not multiple aggregate facilities in an area create um, a bigger impact on air quality than what's projected under the models. So we it's probably more than y'all ever wanted to know about <laughs> aggregates. No, no actually, our, our investigative team did some great reporting on that. So hopefully we see some change. Yeah, um, yeah I was, I was going to jump in on a topic that um, the, the Republicans who are running for your seat um, have been talking about property taxes <laughs> um, and somewhat critical that you were not um, on board with SB2. Um, so talk about that because, of course, your constituents are feeling in the squeeze just like many Texans are. Yeah. Um, what what is the role, if any, that the legislature should play in helping ensure the property taxes are sustainable for people? Yeah, no, I and I think we need to have some really serious conversations about it. And you know, I don't think y'all gave me the what's the most what do you hear on the ground in your district question. But but the big the big driving issue in my district is growth, mm -hmm. and that's really at the core of almost every issue we're dealing with. Is that Hayes County is the fourth fastest growing county in the nation. And that has a lot of ramifications. And one of those ramifications is really high needs for infrastructure and education. Um, you know, we have school districts going out for new construction bonds every couple of years because they can't keep up with the kids. Um, and then another ramification of that is rapidly rising home valuations. And those are reflected by the market, but they're incredibly painful for someone who budgeted based on that a property tax assumption that's not true anymore. And we really do not want a property tax structure that forces folks out of their homes. Um, and that's really what, where we're ending up. And it's, it's wrong. Um, and Texas has ended up here for a variety of complicated reasons. Uh, but here we are in a state where we heavily rely on property tax and sales tax as our main sources of revenue. Um, you know, I did not vote for Senate Bill 2 past that last session because honestly, I think it just makes it harder for our cities and counties to do our job. And it also creates a disincentive uh, to cities or counties ever reducing their tax rate because they wouldn't be able to raise it again easily. Um, you know, there's a saying in business, the easier it is to fire, the easier it is to hire. Well, the easier it is to raise your tax rate, the easier it is to drop it too. Um, we, we previously had an 8% cap in place. I think we should have stayed there. Uh, and the revenue cap model, quite frankly, SB2 affected one of the cities in my district. And that's because we are so fast growth that the way the projections work don't actually catch most of our communities. So it's only the city of San Marcos that will be caught at this point. So SB2 did not make a meaningful difference in property taxes for constituents in House District 45. Um, and, all rem and Representative Burroughs, the author of the bill, you know, said on the floor, this bill does not reduce anybody's property taxes. What it does is make it harder for them to increase in the future, maybe. <laughs> the argument is it makes it harder. Um, 
I think we need to keep looking at the property tax issue. We did do some work this session. We appropriated $5.1 billion um, as part of House Bill 3 to buy down property taxes. Um, you know, that was projected to reduce rates significantly in my district, anywhere from, uh, I believe, $0.07 cents to $0.11 cents on the 1000 uh, depending on the school district and where they were taxing at previously. Uh, and the average homeowner in Hayes County uh, was projected that it would have gone down $200 from what had been projected. <laughs> so the problem is, or I'm sorry, $200 from what it would have been this year. So what, what we were actually hearing on the ground is that most homeowners saw a wash because their property values went up, their tax rate went down, they paid about the same. Um, and that's a really important breath for folks, but it's, it's not enough. Um, and I think we really need to take a comprehensive look at the tax system and issues where it's being abused. And really where I see it being abused is with commercial. Um, the way uh, equal and uniform has been interpreted for our commercial properties means that commercial properties can go challenge and barter down and barter down and barter down their property values. And a lot of commercial property is just not paying its fair share at this point. And so to me, that's really critical to address. As part of that, I also think we should take a look at um, changing the appraisal cap for homestead properties specifically. Um, and I'm open to different solutions and ideas on that. Uh, but right now, your homestead can only increase 10% for the purposes of valuation uh, each year. Now, if you sell your property, it goes back up to whatever the market value is. But that does provide some protection of folks for folks. Um, I think we need to question whether that's enough, especially for really long-time homeowners. Um, if you've been somewhere for 30 or 40 years, 10% becomes less. Um, or that 10% adds up year after year. Um, so that's a, a question I want to have because we do not want to force folks out of their homes and we need to provide some alternate paths. Um, but the critical thing is we can't just cut off the revenue streams either because most of your property taxes go to your schools. And we want our children to have a great education. So the pieces have to be us at the state level looking for more funding for public schools, which we did allocate an extra $6.5 million this year, um, making sure commercial property owners are paying their fair share, and then reevaluating if there's something we can do with appraisals for private homeowners. I need to get that answer shorter. <laughs> Is there anything we didn't ask you that you wanted to? It sounds like you've been scouting the videos. You know, I was reading a Jonathan Tyloff piece, okay. and it popped up, and I was like quite distracted because I was I was doing something else while scanning, and I'm like, oh, that's the, I know those guys. <laughs> um, I'll um, you know another thing I really want to mention related to growth is this question of local control. You know, I've knocked on thousands of doors in my districts, and I can tell you what every single person's head will nod not at is this idea that our communities need the tools to manage growth and maintain local character. And it doesn't matter if somebody thinks of themselves as Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or Green Party, they are concerned about how fast the changes are happening and making sure that they have a voice in what that looks like. You know, I think we have very few people who think there's a door we can slam shut. Um, and I can tell them there isn't. People will still continue to come. We will still continue to grow. Uh, but we want to make sure we grow in a way that makes sense for the community. I want Buda to still be able to feel like Buda. I want Wimberley to still feel like Wimberley. I want Dripping Springs to still feel like Dripping Springs. And that means empowering those local officials to have a little more say over what that development looks like. Um, unfortunately, the trend in the legislature for the past decade or so has really been to take away local control, take away local control, take away local control. And what that means is it's, it's a free-for-all. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I love our cowboy heritage here in Texas, but it's not the Wild West anymore. <laughs> um, you sh yeah. I was going to say, it seems like some of that taking away local control is aimed at big urban areas, the cities. The cities in your district, uh, many of them are sort of rural by nature and sort of culture and spirit, but they're now caught up in this suburban growth thing of uh, the Austin area, San Antonio. Um, it's more of an observation yes. no, than a question. I, and, and so, yeah, it seems like you're. We feel you're caught in the crossfire. That's, that's right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're caught in the crossfire. And again, we really feel it the strongest because, again, our rate of growth is so fast and our cities are so small that they can't keep up. I mean, the city of Buda, I believe, has about 15,000 people in it right now. 
well, there's 30,000 people in the zip code now. I mean, over 30,000, 34, I think was the last estimate I saw. Um, and most of those people are outside the city limits. Some of them are in developments that will eventually become part of the city. Um, but the city has very little say in what that looks like and how many folks end up right on the edge. Um, and then in our more hill country communities, it means we see, you know, multiple different infrastructure build outs. Um, you know, the hill country is very concerned about wastewater discharge issues. Um, I don't think the hill country is ever going to like the idea of people discharging wastewater in our streams. And I think they'll consistently be pushed back. There's no public appetite for it. Um, and when you have individual little subdivisions build, they all go, oh, how am I going to treat my wastewater? Maybe I'll get a discharge permit. And we have another fight about it. Instead of having you know, a stronger city that can take the lead or some type of leverage to ask them to tie into an existing system. Um, so one of the things we've looked at is, you know, where do the cities need a little more authority in their ETJ? You know, I mentioned my dark skies legislation early. We will, earlier, we will, be, ah, we will be bringing legislation next session to give cities dark skies authority in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, and then I think the other question is, where do counties need a little more authority? Um, my district has been ravaged by floods multiple times. I mean, we lost a few people during session um, in the big storms in, eight, in May. And some of the impact of flooding is because of folks building uh, close to the floodways. And so if folks put down more impervious cover, the water runs off faster, fills the creeks quicker, we have more flash incidents, um, and folks get caught up in those. So I also filed legislation, and we'll be filing it again, to allow the county commissioners some say over impervious cover close to these waterways that have a history of flooding. And I think we just we have to keep making sure that's right-sized. Um, one size doesn't fit all. Texas is a big state, uh, but I think we need to make some allowances specifically for these fast growth communities um, so that what we end up with on the ground is a community, um, not a hodgepodge. I might tie that back to Senate Bill 2 very quickly and say, I trust my local elected officials. None of them like Senate Bill 2. This must be really awkward when it's like multiple candidates. No, I, when we have four people, it like it goes by fast, and it's, everybody's you know chopping at the bit to answer rebuttals, and let me speak to that. So that's why this was a little different yeah. more conversation. Here. Yeah. Do they do they all say, um, or have all of them been been uh, civil this round? Pretty They've much been civil. Yeah. We had. We had uh, one little zinger thrown in at the end, and one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, You'll have to watch the videos. Wasn't expected. Yeah. yeah. That's the first one. One of the first ones. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to know, yeah. uh, just for post camera, turn off the camera, at least. <laughs> sure. um, uh, the subdivision you were talking about, or the the, the, the materials. The oh, area it's, with it's the trucks off, in the morning. It's the, Signal Hill. Signal is that the name of the Signal company? Hill Road. Uh, the company is uh, Easy Mix. Okay. Yeah, Easy Mix. Uh, and I can put you in touch with some of the okay. the homeowners there if you like. They actually did a little press conference right after session. Um, they've really been trying to draw attention to it. There have been just multiple issues with the site. Um, yeah. You know, kind of having unauthorized wastewater discharges. And again, and, but I mean, a lot of what they're doing is legal but they've been very much looking for some type of opportunity because it's just completely inappropriately located yeah. to put an industrial facility in a residential area. Mm -hmm. Is that like, where is it? Off Nutty Brown Road. So it's actually, oh, okay. it's in the Austin ETJ. Yeah, okay. So between 1826 and... Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, do you know Nutty Brown Cafe? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where Nutty Brown Road is? And the guy with the long gun, is that rural or urban? No, or? that's a neighborhood in Kyle. Mm -hmm. um, it's been reported on, I believe, by the Hayes Free Press. Uh, but I could, if y'all want to follow up, I can look up the details. I, I never remember the name of that neighborhood off the top of my head. I know how to drive there, but. <laughs> but he just goes for a stroll, and that's how he just likes Yeah, to. and it's just every single time it happens, you kind of watch Facebook blow up, and you watch, mm -hmm. you know, kind of law enforcement just have to do a statement, like, 
it's legal. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just unfortunate because it's, if, if it's not intentionally intimidation, it's still intimidating. Yeah. And a suburban neighborhood is not the place. <laughs>